States and Colombia. And just to, you know, sort of give you an idea of, you know, the kind of spread of, of health tech and, you know, the different types of, of things in here. Yeah, you know, I wanted to, to just uh, touch on these and also touch on, you know, you know, really the hard work of getting a startup off the ground. So all the companies I'm going to talk to you about are six and seven years old, and you know we're all essentially bootstrapped. Um, so I helped start a, a clinical research company in Colombia called Ipsum Clinical. Um, yeah, we started this with 200 grand of money that the founders and some angels had kicked in. You know, had one potential job lined up. Um, you know, and mostly yeah, you know, running clinical research for for U.S. pharma companies. Um, you know. Six years in, you know, we're now running 12 simultaneous studies. Um, and, you know, if anyone's really done startups, you know, we have a, a new problem this year and that we're actually making money and have to figure out how to pay Colombian taxes. So nice problem to, to have um, for the first time in that business. Um, I also, you know, started um, and own a company called Source Meridian. We do primarily healthcare um, software selling to, you um, you know, really life sciences and the companies that, that sell into life sciences, building them software as a service platform. Um, this started with 10 people that I'd worked with in Columbia. Um, and today we have offices in three cities um, looking at a fourth and have 125 people in here. Um, any, every startup's got a story. This one started with, you know, some, you know, some pretty hard scrabble clients that were, were definitely a challenge to get off the ground. And as we, you know, understood the business, you know, you know, figured out what we really had to offer and how to differentiate ourselves in health tech, you know, we're able to grow this thing into, um, you know, six great, you know, world-class clients building software as a service platforms and having, you know, just, you know, some, some incredible impacts out there, um, you know, out, out in the marketplace. And then the, the last one of these is along the way, I became CTO of a company called Purple Lab which really does healthcare analytics for, um, you, know, you know, based on a claims warehouse in the US that has about 70% of all the healthcare transactions over the past eight years. Um, yeah, this started with, uh, you know, with a determined founder that put a million dollars of his own money in there, rounded up some angel money, um, you know, has over 30 clients um, and is growing, you know, yeah, essentially tripling every year um, and is looking to do a private equity round. So, you know, one of the things I wanted to sort of kick this off is, you know, like I've, I've been in startups for a significant part of my career. Um, startups are a passion and they are a long haul. Um, you know, Silicon Valley likes to have this mythology that people roll out of their garage and are going public, you know, six weeks later. Every one of these I've done that's, that's exited well has been five, six, seven years of hard work and 80 hour weeks and, yeah, I just wanted to yeah, sort of start there as we go hear the pitches from these guys, because I know what it takes to get to this point. Um, and uh, yeah, it's an, it's an exciting life we all pick for ourselves. Awesome, Mike. Well, thanks so much. Thanks for sharing your experience. Um, if anybody would like to get in touch uh, with Mike Hoey, I'll drop his email here. Um, it's mthoey at uh, Source Meridian, but I'll go ahead and, and drop it in here um, as well. Again, Mike, I know you're busy. Uh, but if you have a chance to stick around and, and hang out and watch the competition and, and see what the future holds for health tech and wellness, um, we'd love to have you. And if, if not, no worries either, but uh, appreciate your time, sir. Thanks. Wouldn't miss it. Awesome. All right. Well, um, now it's time to meet the media judges. Um, so, uh, Andrea, if you, if you wouldn't mind um, doing the honors. That sounds great. Of course. We are really privileged to have with us journalists who are expert in a range of areas, including healthcare, technology, and entrepreneurship. Judges, after I introduce you, feel free to unmute your mic and say hello so we can put a face to a name. Erica Fry is the senior writer for Fortune Magazine, where she writes features and conducts investigations related to healthcare and international business. She has won numerous honors for her work, including the Work Prize for Global Business Reporting and the Gerald Love Award for Distinguished Business and Financial Journalism, and was the finalist for National Magazine Award for her coverage of the troubled rollout for the world's first dengue vaccine in the Philippines. Before joining Fortune, Erica worked as a writer and associate editor for Colombian Journalism Review 
and as an investigative reporter for the Bangkok Post. It is really an honor to have you here with us today. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Happy to be here. Abu Benu Goshal is the managing editor for The Next Web, one of Europe's leading technology news publication and events company, which is owned by the Financial Times. He and his team produce compelling stories about the intersection of technology, culture, and society within its team of reporters across Europe, Asia, and North America. Before joining The Next Web, he wrote for publications including Gizmo, Lifehacker, and Lifehacker. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, lovely to be here and uh, looking forward to seeing what these startups have going on. David Salazar is the associate editor at Fast Company, a leading print and digital magazine covering technology, business, and design. David has a long history of covering in the healthcare space with previous roles as a reporter and editor at Drugstore News and has interviewed influential leaders in the space, including the CEO of drugstore giant Walgreens. A graduate of Columbia University in New York, he has also reported for the college newspaper, Columbia Daily Spectre. Glad to be here, thanks so much. David, um, excuse me, Heather Landy is the senior editor at Fierce Healthcare, overseeing the team's coverage of health IT and digital health news and trends across the country. She reported on the healthcare space for nearly a half a decade, including with Vendome Group, among others. Her recent work has led to influential reporting on the vulnerabilities found in legacy healthcare systems interoperability policies, and the increasing use of artificial intelligence in healthcare. Thank you be, for being with us today. Hi, it's great to be here. I'm um, looking forward to, to learning more about all the startups. So Rob Kumar leads operations in India for Entrepreneur Magazine, the flagship publication covering business from the Entrepreneur Media Group. He leads a team of special correspondents, social media executives, and video producers reporting from the Asia Pacific region. Prior to joining Entrepreneur, he was an editor at the Financial Express, one of India's largest news outlets, as well as Mint Money, NDTV, among others. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. I think Sarab's so, so running up just a little bit late. Just that's up. Alfred Poor is the editor and publisher of Health Tech Insider, a digital publication dedicated to reporting on wearable and mobile products and services that address that address digital health issues. A graduate of Harvard. He has written on a wide range of technology topics to include more than 22 years writing for PC Magazine, among other major computing titles. He is also the author and co-author of more than a dozen books and was called a game-changing pioneer in 2019 by Christina D. Warner, the author of The Art of Healthcare Innovation. Thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Looking forward to this. Catherine Longworth is a staff writer at BioWorld MedTech, a publication providing news and analysis in the global biotechnology, pharmaceutical, medical device, and medical technology sectors. Based in London, Catherine has particular expertise in the medical technology and digital health sectors and is regularly invited to speak and moderate industry events. Before joining BioWorld, Catherine covered pharmaceutical industry and pharma intelligence. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you everyone and looking forward to uh, connecting with the startups. 
Kit Delay is the Central and Eastern Europe correspondent for Sifted, a Financial Times backed platform focused on the European startups and innovators, as well as a contributing editor at The Banker, another Financial Times publication. He has also appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, The Economist, among many others. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. It's great to be here. I'm excited to hear what, what we have on, on offer today. Raul Sharan is the editor of Startup Beat a technology news publication covering startups and entrepreneurs from the U.S. and around the globe. Founded in 2007, Startup Beat was named a top 100 technology blog in 2012 and also was acknowledged in 2013 by the Columbia School of Journalism Toe Center for Digital Journalism when the site was part of the university's single subject news conference and research project. He is a graduate of Columbia University's Master Journalism program and has held previous roles at the financial news website, Bazinga, and Formula Racing publication, Racing 365. We're happy to have you with us today. Hey guys, really looking forward to um, your ideas and can't wait to hear all the pitches. Fantastic. Well, um, thank you, Andrea, and, and thanks to all the journalists today. Like I, uh, like Andrea mentioned, um, we're super humbled and honored um, to have you here taking time. Um, I know everybody's super busy, so um, without any further ado, we'll go ahead and bring um, the startups on and, and start the pitch competition. Um, startups, just as a heads up, as I mentioned, um, I will bring you on in the presenter role. You'll be able to share your screen. Um, as soon as uh, you begin, I'll start the timer and um, I'll stop you at two minutes. Um, after that, we'll open up for a few questions from uh, journalists and kind of initial feedback as well. Um, and, uh, and, and also journalists really quickly, if you could remember just uh, within the judges scorecard, if you could uh, continue to mark um, and, and find your name in there and, and uh, mark as we go along. That'll be a huge help for when uh, we announce the winners in, in just a bit. So um, without any further ado, we'll start with the first startup. Uh, Jose Martin Quesada, CEO of Crew. Jose, give me one second. I will go ahead and bring you on stage and make you the co-host. All right, you should be able to share your screen right now. And as soon as you begin, I'll start the timer. I can see you um, clearly, and I think I can hear you loud and clear if you speak. Can you see my screen as well? Yep. Awesome. Everything okay. That's good. So, hi everyone. I'm Jose, the CEO of Crew, a digital fitness and health product that has been product of the week on Product Hunt and has some world class early stage investors like Entrepreneur First and Telefonica. Uh, on myself, I've launched products and services at McKinsey and Google. I have seven college degrees randomly on various things. And I've actually competed in things like CrossFit, windsurf. And it's relevant because I've actually been in really poor health in the past. I've been in a coma from a car crash. My lungs have collapsed six times. And the reason that I managed to go from being in such poor health to even competing is because I found the right coach and the right community, uh, which is the foundation of the product that we built. Crew is live and on-demand workouts, uh, where the key differentiation is on the one hand, all of them can be taken in a group if you choose. It can be solo, but otherwise it can be a watch party where you can see all your friends simultaneously. So it's a truly social product. And at the same time, we augment the entire thing with computer vision that would normally require super specialized hardware. We have um, technology that's proprietary and unique in the world that allows us to, in real time, just using your camera of any device, tell your cardio, your technique, your accuracy. This is because motivation is a massive problem in fitness. So we use community and health competition to first get you into the habit and then get you to stick to your workouts. Uh, there's a massive wide open space for a truly social product in fitness. There's already in other industries. So we built a product that besides the stuff that I've mentioned, allows you to, for example, after a workout, share the best moments of your highlights. We're gonna celebrate you. You're always gonna feel good after a workout. Uh, not only do we measure real-time cardio technique and accuracy on the left, but also afterwards we give you a report on the best parts. Uh, we give you avatars so you can be your true self, extend your uh, identity even online, and even well, if you're not comfortable with your body, that's all right with us. 
Uh, this is what the site looks like, but I'm going to take you straight to a session. Uh, I am here, and that's my co-founder. As I move, my skeleton becomes uh, stronger. I can compete with him in real time, depending on how much effort I'm putting in here. And uh, yeah, this is just one of the use cases, cardio, but feel free to ask me any other questions because we are here for it. Two minutes. <laughs> awesome, and time. Uh, fantastic, Jose. Um, you know, really cool and, and uh, interesting background story as well. So I'm sure there's going to be some questions and, and feedback. Um, journalists, please feel free, um, hop right in um, or raise your hand, whichever you prefer. Um, but please uh, go ahead and, and we'll, we'll start it off. Heather, please. Uh, yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yeah. So it looks really interesting and innovative. Obviously, um, on-demand health, you know, exercise and healthcare and workouts. So there's a huge market right now um, with Peloton and um, all these other kind of programs. So, what makes your uh, what you offer stand out from you know what else is in the, in the market right now? We are the only product that you can share in real time with other people, regardless of the hardware you have. You can literally see each other in real time uh, in a watch party setting. The social factor makes you twice as likely to work out. And then more importantly, we lower all the barriers to entry. You don't have to use this one bike that you have in your living room to do the workout. You can literally use us anytime, anywhere with any device that has a camera, whether it's a phone, a laptop, whatever. And because we're the only ones who can see your camera in real time, we can create things like highlights with the best moments of your workout after the fact. And that's really important because we all want to showcase ourselves at our best. And we want you to get that positive feedback, that uh, adrenaline rush of people actually liking the artifacts that come out of your session. Those artifacts also mean that we don't have to keep reacquiring you all the time because uh, we don't only come in contact with you every second day when you're with your workout. There's also tons of content that comes out of just working out. All right, one quick follow-up. What well, does it integrate with any sort of like wearables or sensors to kind of measure? Um, sorry if I missed this, that measures kind of um, vitals and stuff like that. We definitely can, but for us, it was really important that the core experience required no sensors whatsoever. So you still get to enjoy everything just using your camera. Uh, I can, uh, if I have more time, I could show you in real time our AI I can tell your accuracy, your technique, literally just looking at your camera. Um, so we thought that through really, really hard so that, you know, it was regardless of the access that you had to the, to the right equipment. Thanks. Um, very cool. I think Alfred and then uh, Raul. Uh, just very quickly, what's the revenue model for, for this? Uh, primary revenue model is we charge a subscription every month. That's it. Um, that because the content is ours, uh, it's uh, and the margins as, are astounding because of our technology. We don't have to pay cloud costs. Our gross margins are, is is huge, so we have a lot of flexibility in how we charge for the product. We actually have a secondary product uh, where we make a lot of our technology plus some business management tools available for independent professionals. So that's like a secondary revenue stream where we can just take a cut of them using our product to coach their own clients. Um, Raul, if you want to maybe go ahead. Oh, I, th I think you're on mute. So um, basically, um, my question centers around like expertise. So um, you said, you know, your workout can track your form and things like that. But obviously, you know, uh, in my friend circle alone, I have people who are like really, really good at say, you know, squats or planks, whatever it is. And I have people who aren't that good. So wh when you see the social elements integrated in this, how, how do you sort of like deal with that? Because, you know, you obviously can't compare two people at completely different stages of their fitness journey. Yeah, so for us, it was super important that the solo experience, which you take in a workout, which you can do, you don't need to be with other people in a class, that already is giving you real-time feedback on your performance based on these three types of AI, plus an after session report that you can also compare, by the way, with your previous performance. If you are with other people in a class, we're comparing you all on the same base level. Um, our ex research and our experience tells us that if there's a class say, with 100 people, you don't actually compare yourself to number one on the leaderboard. People tend to compare themselves to who they consider their peers. So uh, when we look at things like accuracy, uh, we look at how are you moving with respect to what the professional is doing, accounting for tons of things like how close to the camera are you, missing limbs, uh, angle, we, have, we normalize for all of that. If it's things like technique, we have pre-trained the algorithm to recognize tons of movements, like this is what a perfect squat looks like. When you are at a 59% range of movement, you should, you should squat a little bit lower. That is one of the few things that actually it is an objective truth. This is the perfect squat. And for those things we train. Thank you. Cool. And I think we have time for one last question. Uh, Amin Manu, if you want to go ahead. Yes. Um, hey, Jose. 
I uh, just wanted to ask you about your go-to-market strategy and also how uh, are you planning to approach uh, international markets? Yeah, it's a super interesting question. There's so much noise in fitness, as you can imagine. Uh, there's, there's still not one solution that has cracked the market. You, I mean, you've all heard it. Um, for us, by far, the most important thing is all the artifacts that come out of taking a session. Just when you finish a session, we, we give you six to 10 second highlights in your videos showing you at your best. These are watermarked, as you can imagine. Uh, I haven't actually shown you the avatars in real time, but they can be enriched by filters, avatars. It can show you literally at your best. And so we rely on our members being the ones that actually put that content out there. So same as you, say, as you see TikTok videos with a TikTok brand, even on Facebook or Instagram, just because they're easy to produce and they're engaging. For us, that's the same. Our customers are our biggest advocates. Uh, and then obviously on top of that, we can always use channel, traditional channels that everyone else can use, um, like you know, paid social, um, uh, PR, et cetera. All right. Well, fantastic, Jose. Um, great job. Thanks very much. And congratulations on everything you built so far. Um, judges, uh, just a quick PSA, uh, reminder to keep scoring in real time and we'll move along. I'm going to bring on our next presenter. Uh, Julie Wallach is the co-founder and CEO of Charge Running. Julia, give me, uh, give me one second here and I'll give you the presenter role. Great. Thank you. For sure. And there you go. You should be able to share your screen now. All right. Can you all see my screen? Yeah, I can see it and uh, hear you loud and clear. So whenever you're ready, I'll start the timer. Awesome. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Julie Wallach, the co-founder and CEO of Charge Running. We have all struggled with fitness at some point in our lives. We get started, but sticking to it, rather tough. I'm a mom with a background in business and kinesiology. And even with my fitness background, I always struggled to make running a habit. I tried other running apps out there. I found them lonely. I lacked the motivation and I couldn't hold myself accountable. To put it really simply, I thought running alone sucked. And I'm not alone. Over 80% of Americans really struggle with their fitness. My solution, the charge running app. When you join a charge run, you are connected immediately with a live coach who will give you real time updates on your pace, distance, cadence, and more. And you're connected with runners from all over the world. You can see each other's stats and chat in real time. And you can do this on any treadmill outdoors or on the track. With Charge, you get everything from motivation, accountability, a coach, some kick-ass playlists, but most importantly, a community of support. When I join a Charge class, I know I'm a part of something bigger than myself. And I leave the class feeling strong, confident, and ready to achieve my goals. Our business model is really simple. We have a monthly membership where you have access to your run coach and unlimited runs. Plus we offer two free walks every single day. We formed some incredible partnerships to help us spread the joy of walking and running. We're changing lives and we've impacted thousands of runners already. I'm very excited to continue to grow our community to show others that there is a safe space for them to come no matter their race, gender, size, or pace. Charge running is the place for everybody. Thank you. Fantastic, Julie, uh, great presentation and, and congratulations on everything you built. Um, yeah, yeah, I can, I can uh, empathize there. I, I'm not a big fan of running, so um, that <laughs> might help. Um, we'll go ahead and open up for, um, um, for the judges. Um, I've been you, I see your hand raised first, if you wanna go ahead, sir. Yeah. Hey, uh, Julie, so I did wanna ask you, um, you know, how would you say, um, you know, if, if you want to make this like the Strava of running, um, you know, what, what, what does the challenge look like there in terms of uh, popularizing it and making it a household name? Yeah, so I definitely don't want to make it the Strava of running. We actually integrate with Strava. Strava also is working on building a great community for not just runners, but cyclers as a way to kind of show off mm -hmm. their results. Um, but we do intend to continue to grow our community as a way of showing people that they can come together. We have a lot more social features coming in our product pipeline to continue to grow that and grow that community. 
Excellent. And, and just to follow up there, um, you know, are there any proprietary features that are not easy for another uh, you know, social network or running platform to replicate? Yes, our live feature took us years to build um, because we were playing real time music and giving that real time feedback. It is mm -hmm. not something easy to go and implement because you're getting so much data in real time. Um, so that is some pretty cool technology that no one else is really doing. Thank you and all the best. Thank you. All right, maybe uh, David and then Raul. Thanks, um, and thanks, Julie, for uh, the presentation. I just had one quick question, which is sort of around what sort of coaching takes place and also, like, what sort of schedule those coaches are on. If, uh, you know, or is it like a 24-7 type thing? What sort of um, window opens there and, and what sort of coaching is given? Great question. Right now we offer a little over 20 live runs every single day. Right now we're focused on accommodating the U.S. time zones and we do plan to expand. We offer classes from strictly walking all the way to prepping for a marathon or ultra speed series style workouts. And we do them all based on a level system. So that way, when every person comes in, they're doing it based off their own effort level. We're never saying, hey, you need to hit a seven minute pace, but rather, hey, start this at 30 to 40 percent of your effort. Great, thank you. Sorry, can I just jump in on oh, sure. before that, just because I wanted to follow up on that coaching question. I mean, when it comes to what the the coaches are are offering, I'm obviously that's a key feature, the personalization of that. I'm wondering, you know, how many people they're kind of monitoring at any time. Is it simply kind of support they're offering, or is it suggestions on like lowering your, you know, your le next kilometer and then speeding? I mean. I'm very curious about how, because that seems to be the key, kind of the key differentiator that you have. So I'm wondering, you know, what value you added, added those coaches are actually giving to each runner walker and how many, you know, they have under their, you know, their watch at any given time. Sure. So our classes average a size right now of about nine runners, but we've also tested it where you can get personalized feedback to at least twice to every runner with a hundred within a 30 minute class. Before you join the class, you can also see what kind of style workout. So for example, if you're going in and doing some speed work, your coach is going to work is, is going to take you through a full speed workout and say, Hey, all right, we're going to be picking up the pace for the next two minutes. Let's go ahead and do this in three, two, one, and they'll monitor how you did for those two minutes and give you feedback on that pace and let you know exactly how fast you ran. Cool, uh, Raul, I, I, uh, I saw you had a question, but maybe it was answered. Okay, fantastic. Um, anybody else, Catherine, Erica, wanna chime in? Yeah, maybe right. just to find out a bit more about the business model. Sure, so we offer a monthly subscription, six month and yearly option. All of them come with the unlimited runs, access to your coach. We also put on some races and special events so people get a chance to PR and, and things like that. And then the walks that we offer, um, we offer two a day. They're completely free, no subscription needed. Thank you. All right, well, uh, Julie, congratulations. Um, actually, I'm sorry, Erica, I, I saw you unmuted. I don't wanna cut you off in case you have- Yeah, I just thought this may be a dumb question, but in terms of, it, it sounds like it's mostly audio. Do you have to do much like uh, punching things on your phone or how much interaction with the phone do you have to do while running? Um, that's a great question. And it was not originally in our product when we launched, we never thought people were gonna run a run in text. And we were so wrong. Um, the community aspect is why people continue to come back. We do have a lot of style classes where there's walking breaks or they're full walks. So that's where the most interaction goes on in the chat. Um, you'll see the least amount of interaction when you're in the middle of a hardcore race or in the middle of a speed workout. But we always leave time both before and after the run and you can communicate as little or as much as you want. Thanks. Very cool, Julie. Well, um, congrats on everything you've built so far. Um, and thanks so much for um, that great presentation. Thank you.
All right, we're going to go and uh, bring up our next startup. Uh, we have Michael Lunzer, who's the founder and CEO of Itility Health. I might have butchered that one, um, but uh, Michael, just give me one second and I'll give you the presenter role. No problem. And it's utility, like an internet uh, inform information utility. So, Okay, perfect. Utility Health. Thank you, sir. All right, here we go. Um, you, you should have the presenter role. So if you'd like to share your screen, uh, feel free. Yeah. If you don't need to, don't worry either. Okay, I believe you can see my screen at this point. Yes, sir. Can hear you loud and clear too. So whenever you're ready, just go ahead and start. Awesome, awesome. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. My name is Michael Lunzer. And I founded Itility Health in 2019 with my partner, Kurt Hulander and I, when we crossed paths inside of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota. And there we shared a common frustration that healthcare should work as simply as things do in the rest of our lives. And this inspired Itility Health's mission, which is to bring more efficiency to the healthcare system by applying innovative technology. So studies have shown that over 25% of every healthcare dollar is spent on waste. And in the real world, things are simple. They work easily, quickly, uh, but in healthcare, unfortunately, almost nothing seems to be easy. And why is that? Well, it's caused by the lack of systems working together and a lot of manual processes that slow things down and create frustration for everyone involved. So we set out to change this to make healthcare as easy as ordering lunch online. Well, we wanted to start with a common pain point, something that aggravates everyone and could make an immediate tangible difference. And we identified the prior authorization process as a necessary process, but one that's universally disliked by everyone in the system. We built a solution that connects doctors with health plans and provides a really easy way for doctors to confirm in real time whether a procedure requires a prior authorization. Our solution allows patients to immediately begin treatment for procedures that don't require a prior authorization. And Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Minnesota has said that our solution saves them over $5 million a year in administrative costs. Delivering efficient healthcare without the weight of administrative friction and delays is really critical to reducing cost and improving healthcare. And Itility Health has a strategy to extend our products using medical transparency and AI to deliver widely available automated prior authorizations to the US healthcare system by 2024. And this will save millions for both insurers and providers, and more importantly, deliver faster, higher quality care to consumers. 10 seconds. All Thank right. You. Perfect, Michael, thanks so much. Um, great presentation. Uh, I see uh, Abin Mayu's uh, hand up already, so please feel free to go ahead, sir. Hi, Michael. Uh, thanks for your presentation. I wanted to just understand, um, you know, when you're thinking about the solutions that your company would bring, are there uh, any other competitors in this space already? So our approach is really to focus on bringing together the siloed data systems at the health insurance companies in, in the process. And there aren't many companies in that side of the process. There's a lot of companies focusing in on provider solutions for the doctor's offices and the health, health um, hospitals, uh, but there's not many companies really focusing on bringing together these siloed data pieces um, specifically for prior authorization, but there's many other use cases uh, in addition to prior authorization. Gotcha. And just to follow up, can you walk us through the revenue model, please? Sure. So what we have identified is that in, in our first product, every time a provider um, checks to see if a prior authorization is, a, is required via our tool, it avoids telephone calls and unnecessary prior auth submissions. So uh, it results in about a $5 savings every time a provider uses our tool. And in the case of Minnesota, they use our tool, uh, providers use our tool about a million times a year. Um, so our revenue model is to charge a fraction of that $5 savings. Um, the way we do that is we charge an implementation fee, uh, a small monthly fee that includes some number of those transactions. 
And then uh, above that pre-configured uh, minimum, we charge a per transaction fee. Nice. All right. Thank you. Anybody else, feel free to just hop in. Looks like Heather's got a question. Heather, please. And sorry if, if you've already kind of gone over this, but uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, obviously, this is a huge pain point in healthcare um, that you're trying to address here. So do you so do you sell your solution to providers or to insurance companies? We sell our solution to the insurance company because that's where the medical policies and the rules are defined. There's a lot of companies out there trying to help providers do a better job submitting prior authorizations, but nobody's really um, taken on the problem that we have, which is how do we organize those rules so that they can be used in a technology solution? And so again, we sell to the payer, the health insurance company, because they define those rules. And it's a software as a service tool that they can use internally as their source of record as well because oftentimes those rules are kept in spreadsheets and PDFs in their existing environments. And that doesn't make it very easy to use uh, technology to change a process. Okay, thanks. Anybody else have a question for Michael? Great, thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity. All right, Michael, well, congratulations on everything you built so far. Um, and thanks so much for um, taking the time to be with us today. We'll go ahead um, really quickly, a, a quick PSA, um, just a reminder for all the judges, if you could please uh, continue to fill out those um, uh, forms. Uh, we'll go ahead and bring on our next presenter. Um, if we could have Lauren Longo, founder and CEO of Tally. Lauren, give me one second. I'll give you the uh, co-host space. All right. Fantastic. All right, Lauren, you should be able to share your screen. Okay. I believe that I am. Do you guys see? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep, we can see you whenever you're ready to start. Please feel free to go ahead. Okay, thanks so much. So I am Lauren Longo and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Tally. And our mission at Tally is to empower families with the insights they need to make more confident and data-driven decisions. I am myself a career long user experience researcher and designer and my co-founders are both software and hardware engineers, but first and foremost, we're parents and that's most relevant to the story of Tally. Oh, I'm sorry, it's not switching. There we go. So uh, the story of Tally actually starts with me sobbing face down on the nursery carpet. I was a new mom and I had a two week old baby who wouldn't eat or sleep. She wasn't gaining weight. She was crying all the time. And I felt out of control, like I was failing. My husband and I were working with our pediatrician and our lactation consultant to get things on track, but we were struggling to get a handle on the information they were asking for at every visit. Starting in the hospital, doctors ask you to track feedings, diapers, and sleep to monitor health and development, and families continue tracking at home to identify patterns and shape healthy sleep and feeding routines. So like lots of other parents, we started out keeping track with notebooks and then we tried mobile apps, but notebooks make it hard to see the patterns that you're after and mobile apps take multiple steps to log anything. They actually add work to, excuse me, to the process. We were sleep deprived and overwhelmed and we needed an easier way to keep track in the chaos. Tally gives families three easy options to log daily care and health. The centerpiece of our platform is our one-touch logging device. It's your easy button for baby. We also offer an Alexa skill for hands-free logging into the platform. And our app is the brains of the operation that ties everything together. We launched just over one year ago and we have more than 4 million events logged in the platform to date. We've also had some incredible press coverage and built an amazing network of affiliates and retail partners that are really driving the growth of our community. Our business model, uh, our platform is a la carte, so families can choose whether they want to use the hardware plus the app and Alexa or opt for just the software pieces. On the hardware side, we sell our device at $99 or you can rent it for $19 a month. Uh, the second. baseline features of our app are free with premium features behind a paywall of $3.99 a month. 
We started with babies because that's where our story started, but this year we'll be adding support for later stages of development through toddlerhood and beyond, as well as expanding the platform for senior care and even animal care. And time. Uh, Lauren, thank you so much. Um, and, and great, um, you know, kind of great founder story there as well um, with the background. So um, we'll go ahead and uh, I'm sure there's some questions that will need to be answered too. Um, so we'll hop in and, and start. Um, Abin Manu, if, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead. Hi, Lauren. And sorry, Hi. everyone, if I keep going first. Uh, Lauren, just uh, curious to know, uh, can you walk us through, uh, as, as you said, right, as a parent, uh, you have so many different uh, issues with the baby to, uh, to log. Uh, does, does the uh, hardware component uh, tackle all those complex uh, events that you need to log, or is it more that you also need to then go into the app? How does that work? Yeah, so for our hardware customers, um, we do find that they log on average about 20% more events each day, and they log for five to six times as long as their software only counterparts. Um, the hardware device does enable you to track everything that you would be tracking in the app or in a notebook, you know, whatever your, your other method might be. Um, we track feedings, so bottle feedings and solid food. We track nursing, we track pumping, diapers. Uh, there's a, a button that's configurable out of the box. But what we're working on now is the ability uh, for our customers to actually fully configure all the attributes of each button. So maybe you start out tracking these activities that are pre-configured for that infant time frame. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But then as your needs change over time, you the, the device and the software can change with you. Gotcha. And a follow-up question here is that, um, would you say this is uh, localized to the US only or are, is the product and the, the software service already you know, ready to uh, localize internationally? That's a great question. We have software users around the world. Um, we right now are only authorized to sell in the US. We're working on Canada, um, but we have, we have a massive list of inbound interest from other countries around the world. It initially came from other English speaking countries, um, but we've also gotten um, significant interest from Asian countries as well. So we're working to expand as soon as possible. Thank you so much and all the best. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Alfred, please go ahead. Uh, a, a quick user interface for the hardware panel. Um, is there a, a feedback that allows the user to know that the, the, the button press has been acknowledged? I, I could, there is, I, yeah. I don't know if you'll be able to see it here, but there's, there's an LED that lights up behind each button when it was pressed and you've got a smaller button, our, our Wi-Fi button that indicates you know, when it's transmitting data and things like that. Uh, we're also working right now on a user controlled setting for buttons with a running timer. So sleep, for example, when the baby goes to sleep, you press the sleep button, you press it again when she wakes up and the app is calculating that duration in between. Um, we're working on a setting right now in which the device could, if you want, do a slow pulse of that button to indicate that a timer is running. Um, so yeah, we, we have a lot of mechanisms for feedback on the device itself. Very, very clever, thank you. Thank you. Uh, David, please go ahead. Yeah, I know, <clears throat> excuse me, I know that um, your presentation really focused on, on family and home, but as you're expanding this to be sort of beyond a product for infants, babies, do you see any sort of um, opportunity for use in like a long-term care setting for, for unifying that? Uh, yes. Those I'm records so for staff. I'm so glad you asked that question because I just didn't have time or space to fit it into this presentation, but that is absolutely where we see our biggest opportunity to scale and, and some tremendous opportunity for impact. Um, when we do expand into senior care, that's our next adjacent vertical um, that, that we've really collected a lot of, of early research on, um, it, it is those in-home care companies. We will certainly still sell to consumers. Um, we have a lot of adult children who are interested in using this to help with managing care of their parents. Um, but it's those in-home care companies and those residential facilities that really get also monetary benefits uh, in terms of saved training cost and better compliance from the simplicity of a tool like ours. Great, thanks. And then I guess uh, as a follow-up sort of in its current form, I know you sell the, um, the hardware itself. Is there 
uh, like a subscription fee associated with the software. There um, is. And I'm clear on that. Yeah. I had a, I don't know if I skipped the slide for that or not, but um, yes. So it, our, our app, our software side is free to use the baseline feature set. It was important to us um, not to charge our hardware customers for the hardware and the software. So you can always do everything that you can do from the hardware also in the app for no additional fee. Um, but where we monetize the software is on those more advanced features like being able to configure and customize the buttons. Um, some of the more advanced insights and analytics, those also are the, the premium features that are behind the paywall. Great, thanks. Thank you. Raul, please go ahead. Um, I'm sorry if I missed this, Lauren, but do you yeah. have a on the um, device that you just spoke about? Do I have a what? I'm sorry. A patent? We have we have a design patent pending. It has been painfully slow in light of some of the backlogs that they've got uh, post pandemic, but we're expecting an office action any day on that design patent. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. Uh, we have time for one last question, if uh, anybody has one. Heather, Erica, Catherine, anybody? No. Nope. Um, I've got a quick one. So does yeah. the, the device, you're logging things, does it also alert you to when it's both, like reporting and um, alerting you as to when you should do things and what is that based on if so? Yeah, yeah. So the device itself isn't alerting you right now. It has the capability to. Um, but what people what people have found more value in to date has been more of a push notification. So you can you can set up reminders at given intervals for different event types, and the app, you know, the, the software side will push out um, a notification to your smartwatch, your phone, you know, all those places um, when it's time to feed the baby or that kind of thing. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, Lauren, um, congratulations again and um, awesome uh, presentation. Um, we'll thank go ahead so and yeah, no, thank you. Uh, we'll move forward. Um, we're rounding out uh, the end of the event. Uh, we have the last two startups here. Just another quick PSA, and I'm sorry to harp, uh, but media judges, if you could remember to fill out that scorecard um, so that we can announce the winners pretty quickly. Um, also, um, I uh, would just like to remind everybody that um, we'll, we'll hold a brief Q&A section, uh, session as well. And if anybody from either the audience um, or any of the startups would like to ask questions uh, of the media judges, kind of best practices for media outreach, that sort of thing, uh, it's a really good time to do that as well. So um, let's go ahead and bring up our next presenter. Uh, John Bowman is the founder of Hawken AQ. John, give me one second and I'll... Um, give you the presenter role. All right. You should be able to share your screen now, John. Great. Are we, are we all good? Everyone can yes, see sir. it? All right, perfect. Well, I'm, I'll go ahead and get started. I'm John Bowman. I'm the uh, founder of Hawk and AQ. We are a solution that tracks and improves indoor air quality in commercial buildings. So we spend 90% of our lives indoors. Before COVID, this was mostly spent in commercial buildings, at school, at work, even on the weekend, we go shopping, we might go out to eat, finally head back home. Everything is beginning to reopen. So this pattern is starting up again and we'll be back in commercial buildings more and more. In these buildings, we prioritize saving money over human health for many decades to the point where now most buildings don't meet the CDC standards for indoor air quality. Research out of Harvard has shown that poor air quality is making our employees less productive, is making our students do worse in school, and is a major cause of many common health conditions. Worst of all, <clears throat> it's too expensive to find or fix these issues using, using the old technology in these buildings. So most people have no control over their own air quality. How do we solve this problem? Hawk and AQ monitors indoor air quality in real time and recommends solutions for the most common issues in under 10 minutes. We install affordably, then benchmark air quality against international standards like CDC, EPA, and more 
recommend solutions for common issues, and perform continuous monitoring to ensure a healthy building in the future. How does it work? You install by adding our own air quality sensors or by connecting to existing HVAC systems. Then all the live air quality data streams into our software and we continuously monitor the building looking for issues. From there, we recommend ways to quickly improve the air quality and ensure it stays healthy. Our system works in 100% of commercial buildings and installs faster than a Nest thermostat you can get from Home Depot. We're already installed in large buildings in three countries, including Chicago Public Schools in the US, we're collaborating with companies like Honeywell to quickly expand into restaurants, shops, and hotels. And we're partnering with more great air purification companies to solve even more common air quality issues in buildings around the world. With Hawk and EQ, we'll take back control of our health indoors. Thanks for your time. Look forward to your questions. Fantastic. Thanks you so much. Um, great presentation. Um, and John, uh, we'll go ahead and um, get questions answered from you. Um, I see Avin Manu as well um, has a, the first question. Let's roll with you, sir. Hi, uh, hi, John. Thanks for the presentation. I want to ask, uh, can you tell us about what are the, some of the common uh, recommendations you make to uh, these commercial building uh, property managers about how to improve uh, air quality? Yeah, there, there are a lot of common issues, different ways that the equipment in the building is misconfigured. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the most common ones is there's, there's not enough ventilation. This is particularly prevalent in commercial buildings where in many cases, literally the windows are bolted closed and you can't even open them. Um, the only way is to improve the ventilation. We'll also commonly recommend uh, solutions like increased filtration, uh, bipolar ionization, which, is, which uh, kills COVID and other viruses um, and UV purification. So there are many different tools to combat air quality issues. <clears throat> right, and I have a follow-up, which is, um, you know, what is the benefit or the necessity for uh, buildings to have your system continually monitor uh, air quality even after the initial set of, uh, you know, monitoring and recommendations? Yeah, yeah. So commercial buildings are very complex and, and they change all the time. Right now, the way that air quality monitoring is being approached in the commercial space is usually it's a one-time site survey that a technician comes in and does on site. It's really expensive. It only gives you a snapshot. And like here in California, in Colorado, many other places around the world, you can have an air quality event like forest fires, like high pollen, even seasonal changes affect the building air quality drastically um, from day to day or even hour to hour. Um, so it's important to have that continuous monitoring so you can always be aware and on top of things. Yeah. All right. uh, thank you so much for that. Yeah, John, you made a, uh, in, an interesting point there. Here in Colorado, we just had a, a major wildfire that, you know, came very close to um, hospital. And I remember just seeing on the news the air filters um, after that. And it was just, you know, horrendous. So um, something you don't necessarily think about, um, for sure. Um, I think, Alfred, uh, you have a question if you want to go ahead, sir. Sure. Thank you. So, John, do you see this remaining a standalone service or do you see this as being a target for acquisition by a partner such as Honeywell where they would just make it part of their offering? Um, yeah, for, for sure that's, that's an option in, in the future. Um, uh, the smart building space in general is exploding. There's all, all kinds of, of new solutions to try and solve these common issues in buildings like energy efficiency, um, air quality and other things. Um, so as we continue to grow, uh, there's definitely going to be that interest. Great. Um, we have time for a couple more follow-ups. Anybody, um, uh, David, Catherine, Kit, anybody have a question? All right, uh, Abin, Ma Abin Manu, please go ahead, sorry. Yeah, one more, John. Just wanted to know, uh, can you walk us through the revenue model here that you have going on? Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, so primary revenue model is a SaaS service for the continuous monitoring. Um, it starts at $49 a month, so it's affordable enough for even like a small restaurant to install it. Um, it's great because it helps bring in new guests for them, increase business too. Um, and then it goes up to several hundred a month uh, for advanced uh, monitoring, um, enterprise functionality, uh, like like uh, building in uh, custom alerting 
in, in many uh, enterprise uh, portfolios, they'll have their own air quality standards that they want to apply in addition to what's already recommended by ASHRAE and CDC. So we can customize the software for clients like that too. Right. And just on that, um, like in the US, are there, um, you know, like you have building codes and so on, are there established, um, you know, air quality standards that buildings need to comply with uh, that, that your company can also help, uh, you know, provide certification for anything like that? Yeah, for sure. So one, one common and growing standard um, that's becoming quite popular is a well building standard, which is kind of like a lead certification, but for healthy buildings. Um, that already has international support and we can help with that. Um, and then it, it depends a little bit on the vertical. So in manufacturing, they're more concerned about complying with OSHA and whereas in commercial real estate, it's more about uh, CDC and EPA because of the consumer concerns. Um, so yeah. we can help with all of those. So it's an industry specific solution that's most relevant to, to the standards they have to follow. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Can I also ask, um, so with the partnerships that you have with air purification companies or if there's any works that continue based off the data, is there sort of a so like a referral fee? Like, is there a commercial aspect to those partnerships? How does it work? Yeah, yeah, there is. Um, um, at least there can be. Uh, usually we get started by recommending a uh, new type of solution into a few uh, client installs. We'll see how it goes. And if it works well, we'll scale up into a full a partnership. That's actually a bi-directional situation. So one thing that we're seeing that's really common is a lot of the buildings that are out there in commercial space have invested a lot of money in retrofitting their building with added filtration and ionization in this equipment. Um, but no one actually in the building every day ever sees any of that because it's up in the ductwork where, where no one ever sees it, right? So we can pull data from, from that equipment to prove the value add of that investment as well. So it's, it's a bi-directional situation. <clears throat> thank you. Yeah, thank you. All righty. Well, um, thank you so much, John, for that presentation. Um, and congratulations again to you as well. Uh, we'll move forward with our last startup of the day. Um, another quick reminder, everybody, uh, to fill out those scorecards. And uh, Eunice will, will go ahead and tally those up in the background. Uh, and we'll be able to announce the winner. Um, so without any further ado, our last um, startup of the day, but definitely not least, is Alphonse Carnicero Carmona, founder and CEO of ABLE. Alphonse, give me one second and I'll add you to the screen and you'll be able to present. Thank you, Jim. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here. I'm joining from Barcelona, Spain. So we... do, no, do you see my screen now? Yes, we could see your screen now. But... Um, and I can hear you loud and clear too. So whenever you're ready, uh, you can go ahead and start and we'll start the timer. Okay. Mobility is something most of us take for granted. Did you ever imagine your, your life, how, how your life could change after a disability? This could be your perspective when crossing the street and looking to people. And this, the challenge you would face to reach a bottle of milk. Currently, 1 billion people worldwide see their mobility and independence compromised due to a neurological disease, being the most common causes, stroke and spinal cord injury. These people could walk again if they had an exoskeleton. However, current devices are very expensive as they cost about 100,000 euros and too heavy, weigh weighing over 25 kilograms. Therefore, they are only found in large hospitals and are out of the reach for the patients and many small clinics. This is why we present ABLE, a new generation of exoskeletons that are two times lighter and three times more accessible than current solutions. It comes together with an innovative cloud-based mobile app for a personalized and data-driven therapy. ABLE technology has been born to change the rules of the game, providing efficient rehabilitation and inclusive mobility for all. In this video, you can see Ricard, who is paralyzed from waist down, down due to a spinal cord injury, working again with the ABLE exoskeleton and with total independence. A strong patent portfolio, uh, portfolio ensures protection of our innovations, and we also have a certified quality system by BSI. 
Our technology has been tested by over 100 patients who walked, who walked more than 100,000 steps. Clinical trials have been performed in leading clinical institutions like Institute Goodman and Heidelberg University Hospital, showing improved clinical outcomes and benefits in rehabilitation. Our product is currently undergoing the certification pro process as a medical device and will be commercially av uh, available next year. Market interest has been confirmed, receiving pre-orders for over 300,000 euros in just a couple of months. Our business model leverages product sales for 40,000 euros with annual recurring revenue streams for the software part. Our team combines over 50 years experience in the medtech industry. We have been recognized the best European robotics startup in 2020 and accelerated by Toyota Startup Accelerator, Accelerator led by ISD. Our disruptive technology is on a mission to empower every person in a wheelchair. Let's make this happen. Thank you very much. And time. All right, Alphonse, um, awesome. Uh, congratulations on, on what you've built so far. Um, I'm sure there's going to be plenty of questions, so we'll go ahead and open up to the media panel. Um, and just a quick reminder, if we could also score along as we go, um, that'd be a, a very helpful. Um, uh, not to break away from our trend today, Abimanyu, thank you, sir. Please go ahead and uh, start us off. Thanks. Uh, Alphonse, thanks for the presentation. Uh, can you tell me about uh, a little bit more about the competition in this space? Uh, and you know how you might be able to cut through the noise there. Yeah, uh, this technology, uh, exoskeleton technology, started like over 15 years ago, and uh, it was started because of the military uh, space uh, efforts. So the main companies are, are from Israel, uh, the States, and Japan, and are big corporations. But they they have uh, two products or three products. Uh, only in their portfolios and, and their products are much more expensive than ours and offer. What, what we have done is to offer the features from all the competitors in just one device and also a uh, reduced price. And can you also tell me, you know, what, what is your next big challenge, uh, you know, in, in bringing this to the market and, uh, you know, and achieving ubiquity? Yeah, for us, uh, uh, the, the main challenge is to, to be able to certify this device under the new medical device regulation in Europe, uh, which is something that we are currently working on. And once this is done, then we can unleash the product uh, in the European clinical uh, institutions. And then after, after that, once, once it's properly introduced, uh, the biggest challenge is to uh, have widespread adoption also for personal use, not only in the hospitals, but also in everyday use. Thank you. I'll, this I'll late, our late goal. Yeah, absolutely. I'll uh, pass it on to the next guy, judge to ask questions. Uh, Kit, please go ahead. Uh, so I have two questions. One, obviously, you said there are, you know, the, it's the big players that dominate. But, you know, I'm quite aware of quite a few small startups or smallish that are trying to do what you're doing. So I'm wondering why no, no, none of them have so far broken through. I mean, what's holding it back? And then my second que question is actually to do with production. I mean, how many can you produce? How many do you have out there? What, if you were trying to ramp up production, yeah, how many can you kind of produce in a month and, and distribute? Yeah, regarding the first point, uh, so far, none of the competitors, either uh, startups or, or big players, have been able to, to do such a drastic reduction in the, in the price and the weight. And this is because we have done uh, several uh, innovations. We have uh, some patents that we have been grant granted several competitive projects uh, because of this innovation that we did uh, over with the research group uh, here in, in Barcelona and also afterwards with during three years in the startup. Uh, especially, for example, the bottleneck to design exoskeletons are, are the actuators. So we have developed our own actuator technology that has been patented and that offers unique characteristics in terms of weight and, and, and size and, and, and price. And this is something that differentiates from all, all the competitors in the, in the space. And regarding the second uh, question, uh, production, uh, this is something that uh, we are currently working on uh, to, to incre increase our uh, production uh, capabilities. So, so far, uh, we can produce one exoskeleton a week, but uh, we, 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 we are working to, to raise money so we can expand our production facilities and, and be able to produce one exoskeleton a day.
Um, we'll go ahead with uh, Alfred next. So uh, very exciting product, Alphonse. Um, is this intended to augment people with limited mobility or can this work for somebody who's completely paralyzed? And, and following up on that, is this a product that produces a natural gait or, I mean, how, how is, how is the, the, the steps act, activated, you know, controlled by the, the wearer? Yes, uh, regarding the, the, the first question, uh, we, what we have done is the first product uh, of, the, of our technology uh, targets uh, the population that has the clearest need, need. That is the people that has lost all the mobility. So what we do is to restore this mobility. But we're already working on a second product uh, that is a device for a stroke. In fact, a stroke is why I started this. Uh, my father had a stroke and this is why I devoted like, my studies and later my, my career to this field. And, and a stroke is, is different than, than a spinal cord injury because you, you no, normally you, you, list, you lose just part of your mobility. So there what, you, what the device does is understanding uh, which is the remaining part of, of, of your motor activity that you still preserve and only helping uh, to, uh, to, to with, with the rest. And, and we have uh, future, future ideas for future products uh, also in, the, in this area of uh, enhancing mobility no? and, and more for the elderly population, also a growing target group. So uh, we, we started for the more clear need, but uh, we have uh, the willingness to expand to other potential markets. And, and uh, the steps of these products, uh, there are two ways to trigger them. One is uh, in the beginning, uh, when the patient is learning, the therapist is triggering the steps from, from the back of the exoskeleton. So each step is triggered by, with two push buttons uh, by the therapist. But afterwards, when the, the, when the uh, patient learns how to do the, the weight shift from one side to another one, to the other side, the device uh, uh, understands it and, and is, uh, the, the parameters that are, are, are personalized to each user. So then it's automatically triggering each of the steps, providing a natural uh, gait pattern. That, thank you very much. That's great. Thanks. Hey, Heather, please go ahead. Yeah, um, thanks for your presentation. This was really interesting. Um, so do you plan on selling this product to directly to patients or will you sell to hospitals? You know, how will that, how will the business model work? Yes, uh, in the first phase of the company, uh, our customers are clinical institutions, both private and, and public. And, and this, uh, the business model would be uh, product sales, 40,000 40, euros uh, uh, like transaction for, for the sale of the product. And afterwards, we will have recurring revenue streams, 2,000 euros uh, per year for all the service that we provide, including the software subscription. And afterwards, our ultimate goal like, uh, and, and the mission of the company is to provide mobility not only when you are in the hospital or, or when you are in an, in an outpatient facility, but also at home. This is why we're already uh, developing uh, innovations to uh, have these exoskeletons also in a personal or community environment. But this will come uh, after a couple of years. Thanks, Heather. Um, go ahead, Amimani. Alphonse, I also want to know, um, are, you know, are the exos exoskeletons uh, customized to each patient or is it the same device that can be configured, uh, you know, on-site and with the software? Yeah, great question. Uh, the, the device for clinical use, this first that we have now, uh, it's, uh, it has adjustable uh, segments that are, that are adjusted, uh, telescopic segments that are adjusted, adjusted to each user. And here uh, we have also innovated because uh, we can adjust these segments without any mechanical external tool. Uh, the therapist can adjust this and very quickly. And this is very important to maximize the treatment time within, within rehabilitation. We have done clinical trials and demonstrated that they can put on and take off the exoskeleton in only six minutes, which is uh, an advantage from other devices that do it in 20 or 30 minutes. And uh, this is for the hospital use. For the home yeah. use, then it will be a device personalized for you. And the software is always uh, adapted and personalized to the needs of each individual. And this is something that you do through the mobile app. Right. And, and also, similarly, uh, would it be the same product that uh, someone uses when they have, say, no mobility in their legs? And then uh, and would it also be the same product for someone who has limited mobility, say, due to injury? 
No, uh, the for for a stroke we are developing another product that is more yes. like uh, like it's like a boot, like like if you have a a, a powered boot. I see. It's something okay. like a bit, a bit futuristic. We're working on that, and we'll mm -hmm. see. All right. Thank you. And all the best. Thanks a lot. Um, Alphonse, I had a quick question too. I think um, you know, for for me, the forty thousand. Uh, euro uh, cost kind of it sets a barrier, um, but I'm not sure how in Europe, in terms of um, you know insurance companies, etc., um, kind of are are they already adopting similar type products that they're allowing their their patients to get and they're covering in their in in the insurance or what can you tell us about kind of the future of that? Yes, uh, talking with insurances, we have seen that the, 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 the 40,000 euros uh, range for personal use will still be uh, like a, a barrier for wide adoption. This is why we're still working uh, to, to keep uh, like uh, drawing the, pushing the, the price down. Uh, we, we have seen that they are more used to, the, to, to uh, cover devices that are uh, on the price range between 10 and 20,000 euros, like electric uh, wheelchairs or, or this kind of devices. 40 is a bit, a, bit, a bit more. But this is something that we still have years to, to develop uh, technology so we can reduce this price. And also it's something that will scale up a lot with the volumes that we were able to manufacture. All right. Well, awesome. And uh, yeah, really great work. Um, congratulations again. Thanks for staying up late with us too. I know it's uh, getting later over there in Spain. So, um, all right, folks. Well, that's the end of the um, uh, presentations. Uh, judges, uh, if you wouldn't mind, it looks like everybody has um, their um, scores in, but if anybody doesn't just say so right now and we'll give uh, another quick minute. Um, I also wanted to, while, while the judges are um, doing their final tallies, I wanted to take this time, um, anybody in the audience or also um, any of the startups today, if you guys have specific questions for uh, the media um, panel today, I'd really be, you know, uh, it'd be a great opportunity to um, kind of ask questions. Um, and we can take a few minutes to do that as well, um, um, that we have extra. And if not, we'll, um, we'll go ahead and we'll uh, announce the winners and, and get everybody out of here ahead of time. But please feel free. If anybody has a question, uh, shoot. I have a quick question. Um, as yeah. some of us I know are seeking funding soon or will be in the future, um, and there's a lot of crowdfunding platforms that are really popular. And um, is there anything that can get the media's attention to kind of share those type of things when it comes to crowdfunding? Please go ahead. I'm in there. So uh, Julie, on that front, uh, I, I think uh, at least the publications I've worked with, uh, you know, we have been wary of just, you know, any kind of uh, unestablished company uh, approach it, crowdfunding platform and then trying to get media coverage uh, for that, right? So then what uh, helps a whole lot, as with anything, you know, even if it's say a hardware product, right? I think uh, what's uh, really helpful is to be able to uh, demonstrate a prototype uh, and also show the kind of interest in the community, right? So, um, you know, if, if you're seeking uh, coverage, just saying, uh, hey, we're gonna launch on so and so day, uh, and, you know, we're an untested product and we don't yet have something to show you. All of those things, you know, tend to make us a little bit more wary of, uh, of the product at, uh, in question, right? But if it's something that you have in hand uh, and, you know, your community is already kind of behind you, uh, then I think it makes a bit more sense. But uh, so but I know it, it does seem like a bit of a chicken and egg situation there as to, you know, how do you get there first? How do you get the coverage first, et cetera? But uh, like I said, um, I, I think if you do have uh, something that, that you can show off, uh, that you can have, uh, that you can demonstrate, and also to journalists who are actually interested and knowledgeable about that specific space, right? Uh, for, so if it's running, you would want to talk to uh, journalists who have actively been covering, you know, uh, running technology, wearables, and all of that. Right, so they can actually compare it against whatever else is out there in the market and competing with you, and then they can actually, you know, say that hey, I, I actually love this, or this isn't quite up to the mark, and that's valuable feedback for you. Great, thank you. 
And, and maybe to piggyback off that question too, I, um, because uh, um, Abin Man, um, Manu kind of covers startups and, and um, technology industry, I'd be happy to hear Heather's um, viewpoint on that, on kind of the barrier of, of what types of companies you would consider covering or look for um, as you're kind of reporting more um, in the industry vertical of, of the healthcare uh, industry. All right. Well, for you know my publication, we really focus very specifically on healthcare. So um, providers and payers, we're not consumer facing. So for a publication like mine, we would really want a company that um, is going to be used in the healthcare industry, you know, by patients or, you know, something that is going to be of interest to providers or payers. Um, so not, you know, really consumer facing, but the same kind of idea, um, you know, we'd want to see some, um, some, you know, proof of, of what problem you're trying to tackle in the industry. Uh, want to see, you know, what partners you might be working with, you know, if, you know, if, do you have any kind of evidence as to how your particular product solution is improving healthcare in some way? Perfect. Thanks so much. And uh, Alfred, maybe if you wanted to add to that. Uh, yes, please. I was going to, I was going to amplify that by saying, um, uh, uh, we, we love studies. We love proof, you know, and so anything you can do that shows objectively that, that the two things I like to say is one, that you're measuring what you think you're actually measuring. And two, you can prove that it, there's a benefit to that. Um, those are two of the, two of the hallmarks that we look for in this, uh, before we decide to cover a story. Fantastic. Thank you, Alfred. Um, anybody else have a quick question for the media panel? Don't be shy. No? All right. Well, in that case, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, announce the winners. Um, Andrea, uh, if, if uh, you don't mind, uh, would you do the honors? Um, and then startups, when we announce you, we'll announce the, um, the third, second, and first place winners. Uh, feel free to um, come on and, and you know, say hello or say thank you and, um, and kind of go from there. Yes, certainly happy to. So in third place, we have Michael Lenzer, founder and CEO of Atility Health. Congrats, Michael. Thank you, appreciate it. Yeah, great presentation. So thanks so much. In second place, we have Alphonse Carnicero Saroma. Sur I'm sorry, apologies Car for that. Carnicero Carnicero. Yeah. <laughs> Founder and CEO for AVOL. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Congrats. In first place, we have Lauren Longo, founder and CEO of Tally. All right, Lauren, congratulations. Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate it. No, this is, uh, this is really awesome. And I, I just want to say um, congratulations to you, but also uh, congratulations to everybody that, um, you know, had the, had the guts to get up here uh, as well and present. So um, uh, real quickly, um, uh, I don't know, Lauren, if, if you wanted to say a couple words, we're happy to hear kind of what's next for you as well. Sure. Yeah, I'd love to. I'll try to keep the words brief. Uh, but yeah, what we're really excited about next is like we talked about, um, you know, making the, the platform even more flexible and more configurable uh, and then expanding into all of these adjacent verticals. So there's there's family life and family care. And, and you know, we see ourselves as being sort of the command center for family life. It'll light up, you know, you can configure Tally to light up when it's your daughter's day to feed the dog and it stays lit. That button stays lit until she presses it to say that she fed the dog and it lights a different color when it's your son's day to feed the dog. And, and that kind of, you know, family command center is really exciting in a lot of ways. Um, but then, you know, senior care is such a tremendous opportunity. Um, there's so much that we can do there. But then um, we also already have some pilot applications out there around symptom tracking, um, which, which really dovetails nicely into even, even other adjacent verticals, such as um, like managing diagnosis and care of epilepsy is one that's come up a number of times. So there's just so much uh, that we want to do. So our challenge really is just to, to maintain focus right now and, and make sure that we're hitting it out of the park uh, in our, our current space and then very carefully plan uh, our, our expansion into these next verticals. But um, we're just 
so excited about the potential and I'm so grateful uh, that you all saw the same potential today. Awesome, Lauren. Well, uh, don't forget about The Bachelors, too. I could probably use that to remind me to eat every once in a while, too. So, Absolutely. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you so much. And congratulations uh, again. Congratulations uh, to all the startups today. Um, and I want to sp send a special thanks to all the judges. Uh, really humbled um, to have such talent uh, in-house today um, to give feedback. Um, we'll go ahead and send follow-up emails to everybody as well with um, with information if anybody wants to get in contact um, please feel free to reach out to me um, uh, as well jim at publicize.co um, and i can put everybody in contact um, really quickly um, just want to thank again uh, my co-host andrea short uh, andrea it's always a pleasure to to host with you so thank you so much for being here thank you jim and um, also to our special guest, uh, Christian Birk, uh, and also um, our other special guest, uh, Mike Hoey. Um, thank you so much, guys, uh, for joining us as well. Um, finally, to the startups, um, everybody that took time out of their day to be with us and to the attendees that are listening in. Um, and a very special thank you as well to my colleagues, Eunice uh, and Natalia, who put all this together on the back end. Um, so without them, it wouldn't be possible either. Really happy to um, host everybody and see some familiar faces as well. So we hope to see you guys back for the next Connect event, and we'll definitely be in touch. Uh, but until then, congratulations, and everybody have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.